Hey everybody, I'm going to give you a look at the fish tub, fish pond I have. It's actually a old hot tub and to keep the cost down I used this old hot tub and plugged up all the holes. If you look over here, that is where one of the jet hole, jet jets were for the hot tub and also one here, one there and one over here. I've got the water turned off so you can kind of see through to the bottom. And I thought a lot of this uh, was dirt and stuff, but it's algae and I actually stirred it and it doesn't move all the time. So this is pretty clean, although the water is kind of tea colored. <laughs> I think it's got to do with some of the leaves, the mint leaves that kind of got in there and I don't know that I'll ever get the brown color clear but the fish don't seem to mind. I haven't put the fish in yet. It's gotten cold. Uh, last night it was in the 40s and I don't want to put the fish in yet. They're still in the house in an aquarium. They're outgrowing this aquarium though so I need to do that soon. Maybe this week I will because the water does seem a little it's not as cold as 40, but usually the greenhouse stays 10 degrees warmer than the outside. And the water in the hot tub or the fish pond stays 10 degrees warmer than the greenhouse. So usually I'm able to keep it about 20 degrees warmer than the outside. I measured this with a thermometer that logs temperatures every 10 minutes and stores the highs and lows for the hour. It's called my thermo flasher circuit. Anyway, it's become uh, good for watching temperatures in and out of the greenhouse. Oh, look at this. This tomato plant that survived over the winter is putting flowers out. So that's good. Okay, let's go back to the hot tub here. So I plugged all the holes. Like I said, I used um, peanut butter jar lids. Yes, those are Jiffy peanut butter brown lids. I used the brown ones because I figured they'd resist UV, but you know, there's not a lot of UV light in here. Uh, I'll describe the lighting here in a second. But I used the black uh, aquarium silicon around the lids. You can see the black strip and that is aquarium safe, so hopefully food safe. And um, also there's tons of little holes at the bottom. One, two, three, looking at my shadow here, four, five, six, seven. Those were all holes coming into the hot tub. I had to glue all the, or sorry, I had to use the caulk, aquarium caulk on those too. And there were a couple at the bottom, which, can't see really. Um, so I had to caulk all of those holes up to make for a waterproof tub. Now this tub is <clears throat> holds about 330 gallons I calculated. The problem is this bench seat that just takes a lot of the volume out. And so the it's about five foot wide. I put these boards on the edges because the fish tend to jump out when they, I don't know, they, they fight over the food or something. They just Sometimes they jump out. I, I lost one fish, so I put these boards all around. Sometimes I put a, a sort of a grate, a, f a fencing grate that I have to cover the corners so they don't jump out. Um, so that's how it's a, the tub is circular and it really takes up more volume than the amount of water that it holds. So. I wish I would have not put this in, but maybe used IBC totes instead. I've got a bunch of those now, but I didn't have them when I had the hot tub offered to me for free. So it works, and uh, I don't see myself replacing it anytime soon. I've still got a lot of room in the greenhouse. I'm only showing you one side of this greenhouse for now. I'll show the other side later, but it's kind of a mess. But I did want to show my fish feeder, at least get a peek of it here. Let me show you what this, you might have wondered what this hanging bucket is doing. Well, the hanging bucket houses a fish feeder. It's hanging by Cat5 Ethernet 
cable that goes into my um, controller over here. And what it does, it sends stepper motor signals through this wire. And I've actually got stepper motor and a fish feeder on the inside. It's covered by the bucket so that any critters that get into the greenhouse will really have to work to hang upside down and try to get at the food under there. I figured that might be a problem. Oh, listen, okay, the pump is trying to turn on. As you can see, the water has run dry, so the bell siphon cannot start. And so the sump pump, which is underneath here, underneath this box, has the pump. And you can hear it's trying to turn on, but it's saying, it's reading the probe is 515, and it needs to detect water at about 425 or lower for the pump to stay on. So it'll turn off here in a second. As you can see, the, there's no water flowing because the, the water usually flows out of this and touches the wire sensor as I showed in the previous video. But there's no water. The sump pump is dry and it turned off. It detected dry pump and it looks like the pump hasn't been on very much today. Okay, so back to this fish feeder. Get the camera to focus. So um, the way I worked this stepper motor, it's just a bunch of Lego kind of hot glued and strapped together that turns this peanut butter jar. It's hooked into the pump controller and this will not spin if the pump controller is detecting a dry pump because I don't want to feed the fish when the pump isn't running. I want to be able to filter the water when the fish are eating and releasing their excrement. But I have a way here to um, fill the fish feeder. This hangs on a wire right in there. It hangs on this little thing, this hook. And I want to fill it. Uh, excuse me. And I want to fill it. I just bring it over here, set it upside down. And I actually have this um, disabled right now because I know there's no fish and I don't want the Thing to turn on even when it's trying to turn on the pump. I, I have code to wait to do the fish feeding, um, but since there's no fish in here when the pump was running, I just didn't want it to turn on the fish feeder. And I don't have a switch actually to turn the uh, fish feeder off, so there's my switch. <laughs> it's mechanical. Anyway, I undo this. Um, let me do this off camera. So you could see um, I messed up in doing one hole here. I actually only need this hole on the lid. I have two holes in the lid, but when I screw it on, it goes into the this position. So when this turns around, this can turns around, uh, it dumps once into the little reservoir created between the lid and this pink spot here. It dumps a little bit of food into there. See? And that way it only doses that much food in at a single feeding when it comes out the bottom here. Which well, is really hard to show. There you could hear the food come out. Okay. So it dumps that much per feeding. But the cool thing is I have this program to spin uh, about five degrees every 10 minutes. And it's also controlled by a little potentiometer as to how often. So it's not always 10 minutes. Sometime it could be, you know, depending on how much I turn this little potentiometer on the controller over here. I go back over here. 
this controller, I have a knob here and um, I can control how f how much it spins during the day. Right now I have it turned all the way uh, to the least feeding. And here's a little button I added uh, just to test. You could hear it, it's spun only one time. If I crank it up, press the button for testing. One, two, three, four, five. So that's in the max feeding. It spins 10 times every time it spins every 10 minutes. So otherwise, if it's at the least setting, it only spins this like one time every 10 minutes. That's how I get uh, variable feeding for when the fish grow bigger. I just feed them more. It's not automated as to how much it feeds. I just come and turn the switch or turn the potentiometer. It's a cool circuit though. It lets the fish grow and lets my fish feeder accommodate the bigger fish. Oh, you might be wondering what this other bucket is doing in here. Um, this is a submerged bucket with lots of little holes I drilled so that the water uh, rises a little bit during the day and at least percolates through the bucket. And this is where I put my little uh, fish fry when my big babies, uh, when my big fish have babies, uh, I scoop them up with a net and just put them in here so they don't get eaten by the bigger fish. Um, at first, the tilapia, they protect their young in their mouth, actually. But later on, I think the other fish try to eat the little fish fry. And that's where I keep them until they go into the house for the winter. That way I'm not having to refresh water two places and uh, I've kept hundreds of fish in this little bucket when they have fish. I don't keep track of my breeder fish. Um, you're supposed to keep track of the tilapia breeders and separate them and have them in a separate pond you know and you, you're never supposed to eat them but it's too hard for me to figure out which ones are the ones breeding when I have them all in my pond. Um, so I actually ate them one year and <laughs> I just uh, got a new pair of breeders from the little babies, you know, the next year. So it's a continuing cycle and I'd like to be able to identify my breeders to have a consistent breeding pair, but I just can't figure out which ones they are when I have like 12 fish in this pond. So if you have any ideas, I'm open to hearing them. Um, I guess that's about it. Uh, next week, hopefully, I'll be putting the fish in, releasing them in, putting them in, setting up the fish feeder to actually put food in the pond. So stay tuned. Please subscribe. It really makes a difference to me. And I will see you next time. Signing out. Bye.